Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is uh, Ola Hallengren, and I'm going to talk here about uh, Query Store. So can I start by asking, uh, how many of you are using Query Store today? OK. In production or only in development? Production? OK. OK, so I will start with a little bit of an uh, overview of to Query Store, uh, for, for those of you who have not been using it. And then I'm going to go into some uh, little bit more advanced scenarios. So um, let's see here. Please uh, silence your phones. And uh, take advantage of uh, everything that uh, PASS has to offer. So here's some information about me. I work as a database architect in an um, investment bank in uh, Denmark called Saxo Bank. So uh, here's my uh, contact information. You're welcome to send me emails uh, after the presentation if you have any uh, questions that uh, I cannot answer today. So I'm uh, Microsoft MVP since some, uh, some years back in the data platform. I also do some uh, database consultancy um, outside, uh, outside the job in the bank. So as I said, I will give an overview about Query Store, and then look at how we can use Query Store in different uh, performance troubleshooting scenarios. And also look at some very specific scenarios, see how Query Store is behaving. Some things that we have run across in the bank, uh, something I run in, in, across with uh, other customers. Some, some things you might know about, some things might be uh, new things. And uh, I have some demos also on uh, some of the different scenarios. So Microsoft and the SQL Server team, they are promoting Query Store as the flight data recorder of uh, SQL Server. And by that, I mean that it's, it's capturing a lot of things that's happening um, in the database engine. So you can ba go back in time and see what happened. After there's been a problem, you can go back and see what happened to that query, what happened to that execution plan, what's their timeout, and so on. So it was introduced in uh, SQL Server 2016. And it's uh, very easy to enable it, just an auto database command to enable it. And all, the, all this uh, performance monitoring data is stored inside a user database. So as opposed to the DMVs where everything is just stored in memory, here is persisted inside the user databases. Which means that if there's a failover, then all, or if you make a backup, then all the query store data is included. So how can you use query store? What are like the different scenarios? So here are a few of the most common scenarios. So one thing you can do is that, OK, you have a database. Maybe you don't have any specific problem, but you just want to see who is using the most resources. And then you can talk to developers and maybe try to optimize those queries. So another thing that you can do is that, let's say that you have an ongoing performance problem. And then you want to see, are there any execution plans that maybe was good before, but right now they got bad planned? Microsoft used to say that those queries, the, the plans has regressed, regressed queries. And there's also quite a nice uh, report for that in the management studio. Yeah, I've highlighted those uh, reports here in red. So another scenario, and that's what I'm going to talk the most about today, that is if you have a very specific scenario, specific problem, an ongoing incident maybe, or an incident that happened last night, and you want to in investigate that, find out what, hap what happened. Could be that the developer is coming with something. Maybe the monitoring team is asking, what about this incident? How can you use queries to, to find out about that? And we will see that in some scenarios, it's quite easy. Some scenarios, it's a little bit more tricky. So another scenario that uh, Microsoft is promoting um, is that when you change the incompatibility level or the kernality estimator, then it could happen sometimes that most of the queries are running fine after the change, but maybe a few queries are running badly after the change. Maybe they got the different plans, and it might be that it was not so good plan. What you can do then is if you have queries still running, 
you have it running for a while, then you do the change, and then after the change, it's possible to use Query Store to force plans if there's any new plans that is performing badly. So that we've used uh, several times, and it's very powerful. Maybe you had a few hundred queries, maybe just one or two of them performing badly after the change, then you just use Query Store to force the plan to the old plans. Another scenario that uh, we have been using quite a few times, that is if you have, um, <clears throat> so a few, a few years ago, Microsoft introduced the command clone database. And with that command, you get like the structure of the database, and then you can make a backup to that. Query store is also included in this uh, database clone that you get. And so why is that useful? So that's useful, for example, if you have support case for Microsoft, and you want to ship some data to them about uh, how the queries are performance and plans and so on. Maybe if you're working with a software vendor, then it could also be really useful. Maybe a consultant company or developers that don't have access to production. They should, they're going to investigate the problem. You can take a snapshot of production, restore on the development server. So there are different scenarios how you can use it. Any questions so far? Yes? So the question here, is there any automated uh, purge process for the query store data? I will show some settings for that a little bit later. Yes, there is. You can specify how long you want to keep the data, how many days, and then it will uh, be purged automatically. So, okay, now let's look at what data is stored in query store. So it's like two parts of query store. You have one part that contains all the queries and all the plans. And it's like it's only the first time a query is executed it's getting stored in Query Store, and then it's like there. And the same thing with the plans. The first time a plan is executed, then it will be stored in Query Store, and then the next time, okay, but then it's already there. The other, the other, the other part of Query Store is what's called the one-time statistics, and in 2017 also weight statistics. So the runtime statistics, that is information about how many executions, um, what was the CPU, what was the reads, what's the, what's, what was the writes, and so on. And the good thing in Query Store um, that's different from the DMVs is that Query Store is persisting the data and it's persisting it in intervals. So by default, it's like one hour interval. So you can see like hour by hour, back in time, you can see what happened. That means that you can also Compare how it's running today, compare how it's running yesterday, was it more execution, was it uh, different plans, anything. You can also, um, it's also separating it based on if it was successful execution or if it was, was aborted or uh, if there was some kind of exceptions. So in Query Store you can see, has there been any aborted execution? or was everything successful? Or how was the plan different in the aborted executions compared to the successful executions? Uh, waste statistics also from 2017. So you can see the same as the runtime statistics, you can see hour by hour, you can see the waste statistics. And the waste statistics, uh, maybe have you, have you been using the, the DMVs for waste statistics? The good thing here is that you have waste statistics for each query, for each plan, and for each interval, meaning for each hour. So you can see that, oh, this query was having some uh, locking problem maybe at 12 o'clock yesterday. Very powerful. Or maybe a disk problem or uh, anything. So, as I said before, it's also possible to use Query Store to force plans. So, you can use this plan, plan forcing either through the management studio GUI or there is a store procedure for it. And uh, it's very easy. There is a query ID and a plan ID. If you do it through a management studio uh, GUI, you don't really even have to do that. Then you just click on a, on a plan. If you want to use the, um, the store procedure, just the query ID and the plan ID. And there's another store procedure to unforce it if you don't want it anymore. And if you do that, then, query, sorry, then, then SQL Server will just continue to use this plan 
even if the server restarts or if statistics is getting updated or anything. As long as it's possible for SQL Server to use this plan, it will use it. If you, for example, drop, this, drop the index or something, okay, then it cannot use it. But as long as it can use it, they will continue to use this false plan. Even if there's a failover, it will continue to use this plan. So have you been using plan forcing? Okay. And how it's been working? Well, I'm just, I got a question. Yes, of course. So you said like if you drop an index, it's not going to force that plan anymore. Is it going to give you an error message like with the same guy? Okay, so the question is what happens if you have forced the plan and then maybe you dropped an index afterwards? What happened then to the query executions? So no, it works differently than a plan guide. Uh, with a plan guide, you get an error in this case. With query store, um, the user applica or the application will not get an error. They will not notice any difference. The only thing is that SQL Server will say that, okay, this false plan is not possible to use it, and then it will do the normal optimization process. It might be that the, the, the application is maybe getting a little bit slower response because it's not getting this uh, false plan that was uh, good, but no errors. Yeah, so, so, so question is, um, okay, are there any views or anything so you can see which plans are successful or if there's any um, uh, false plans that have failed? There is, I will show a bit later, in one of the views you can see if there are any, any false plans that fails, then you can see that. Um, and you can also see the reason for it. There's a few different reasons that why this can happen. Okay, so I have a demo here. I'll try to show some uh, plan forcing. Okay, so I will start each demo by clearing the caches and uh, clearing query store. So what I will do now is I have a demo where I will try to simulate a parameter sniffing problem. Um, one store procedure, um, different parameters, and we'll make it so that we have two different plans, one good plan, one bad plan, and then try to force the good plan again and see how we can do that. My, in most cases, maybe the real production scenario is a bit more, more, more complicated, but just to show you how it works. So I will start here. So here I have a store procedure that's uh, just uh, getting orders and it's just taking a customer ID as an input parameter. So this customer only have one order. So I will execute it now 10 times. And you see it's really, really fast. Less than, uh, yeah, less than one second for 10 executions. Okay, now we have another customer here. This customer here has a lot of orders. So I will do a recompile. And then I will execute it with other customer. So now we see that's taking some time and it's returning a lot of data. So now let's try the other one again. Before it was fast, and now we see, now it's taking a longer time. And that is because the store procedure has now got a plan that is optimal for the customer that had a lot of order, so it's got a scan plan instead, and now with the other customer, with only one order, it's not so good. So this is quite a common scenario. So um, before we try to force the plan, we, try, we need to Let's try to look at, uh, look at it in Query Store, see how it looks like. So Query Store, as I was showing before, there are a number of views in Query Store. So always when you, when you need to analyze a problem with Query Store, you need to start by finding the query ID. Query, query ID is like the key to anything in Query Store. If you don't have the query ID, then you cannot really uh, fix anything or analyze anything. So I will just filter here on the object ID and find the query ID here. 
So we have create a for. OK, now I copy the query ID. And then I will look at the plans. So there's another view here for the plans. So then we can see here two different plans. And it's also possible to look at the actual XML here and the graphical execution plan if you want to do that. Now let's see the runtime statistics, see how that looks like. So um, again, I take and um, paste the query ID in here. So what have we got here? Okay, we see for each of the plans we have one record here. The int of LED is the same because it's like the same hour and I was resetting query store before I started, so it's like only one hour's data. Um, we have the execution type. They were both, they're both successful. And then we can see here number of executions and the duration. And then we see there's a huge difference here in the average duration. One is super fast. This is microsecond. So this is just like one millisecond. And this one is something like 14 seconds. So we really want, if it's just maybe one customer that has this, or this uh, huge number of orders, then we don't really want that plan. We want the other plan. So how can we do that? So what I will do is that I will take the query ID again, and then I will look at it in the Management Studio GUI. So I go here into the database, query store, track queries. And then you can just paste in the query ID. So then we see here that we have the time here. We have the duration here. So this is in uh, milliseconds. So um, we saw that one of them was 14 seconds. So we can also hover like this and see 13.8 seconds. And the fast one here. So now we want, we want this plan. We can see here also this is a seek plan. This one here, scan plan. So now let's see, we want this one. This is the fast plan. So I force it, just click here. Do you want to force plan four for query four? Yes. And now we can see that there's a checkbox there. So that means that the plan is forced. And if we go back to the, to the views, and if we look at uh, the plans, Then we will see here is false plan. So we can see now, yes, this plan is forced. Okay, so that's good. The next question in, is then to check, okay, is it working? Is it fast now? Is it using the plan as it should? So let's try that again. So we take the order again, but, um, the customer with only one order, and execute again. And then we see, now it's super fast. So uh, now Querystore will, just will just continue to use it. And it will use it for all the customers, no matter uh, if it's a customer having one order or a lot of orders. Yes, question here? The next one, the other query will be a little bit more uh, fast and slower. Yeah, that's, that's right. So the, the comment here was the other query was, will be a little bit slower because there will be a seek plan for the other one. But it's, yeah, you, have to opti you want to optimize it for the most, of the most of the parameters, most of the executions, so that's like the, the price. Yeah? So what happens if you have a query that spans multiple databases? So you, you enable the query to go to a database. Yeah. So let's say you run a query against master and you have all the apps with fully qualified queries. Do you have to enable it in the master or which database do you have to enable it? Okay, so question here, what happens if you have uh, queries that spans multiple databases, like cross-database queries? To be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, we will have to test that. 
I will happen to, if you can send me an email afterwards, I will happen to test it. I'm not sure. I don't think you have to, can enable it in, in uh, master. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have to test how that behaves. One more question here. Oh, it seems, uh, so the question is, do we need to recompile? I did not do that and it was still working. So it seems like when you force the plan, that I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's done automatically then. At least there was no need to do an explicit recompile. Another question there? So, sorry, can you say it again? Yeah. No, no, it was the same query. It was only one query. Oh, oh, okay. You mean with the, um, yeah, that will be, that will be a bit slower than, than before. So this one customer with a lot of orders, that execution will be a bit slower than before. So that's like the price you have to pay. So yeah, one more question. Um, so, I mean, it's used in the normal uh, caching, so that how it works is that, okay, there's a compilation, it's going into cache, and then it will be stay in cache. Then whenever something is triggered, we compile. Then it's actually not like this, that it will grab the plan from query store and just use it. You would think it works like this, but that's not how it works. How it works is that the optimizer will go through the normal compilation process, and then we'll continue to, uh, to do our optimization until it finds a plan that looks like the one in Query Store. And then we'll use that. I mean, there will, be the normal there will be the normal compilation process. I can show you one thing here also. So actually, Query Store is using an optimizer. There is a hint called use plan. That's what the Query Store is using. So uh, the same thing as you yourself could execute a query and copy the XML into the use plan. That was, uh, that's what Query Store is doing. I thought maybe you could keep it in the code cache, but it's not. No, no, it's not working like that. There's no plan guides involved. This is totally separate from plan guides. Yeah, one more. So how do we translate the overhead for the um, okay. okay, so question, what, what about the overhead for, the overhead, the general overhead for Query Store. So the question uh, was, what about the overhead for Query Store? So um, in general, a few percent. Uh, that's what Microsoft is saying. It is less if you have uh, stop procedure or uh, prepared queries, uh, parameterized queries. If you have a lot of ad hoc SQL, then Query Store is not so optimal. Because what happened then, if you have a lot of ad hoc SQL, then it will be like every new query that's coming in will be a new query in, in a query store. The plan needs to be changed, meaning that it has to store a lot more data. And also the plan forcing will not be working because it will be a, like a new query every time. So for extreme ad hoc scenarios, query store not, not that good. Yes? Yeah, I mean, it works well. It work, there's no problem with data warehouse. The, where, where you have to be a little bit careful is if you have databases with ad hoc queries and huge number of queries, meaning thousands of ad hoc queries per second, then it's not optimal. A data warehouse is most, most of the time big queries, but not so many queries. We are running it in Saxo Bank. We are running it as standard on all our databases, from data warehouse to super core trading databases. Yes, last question here. Okay, okay. So the comment here, yeah, comment was that there was a uh, uh, gentleman here that's experienced 40% uh, overhead. I would recommend then open a support case with Microsoft if you experienced that. We have not experienced that. Okay, try updating the latest uh, CU and then uh, support case for Microsoft if it doesn't fix it. Okay, last question here before I proceed. If you turn it off, do you lose all the history that you have in 
No, you're not. So the question was, if, what if you turn it off, what happened? So you still have the data. You still have the data in the database. So you can analyze it afterwards. OK, so let's proceed here. So uh, in, the, in the demo before, we just have two different plans. So this is just an example from uh, Saxe Bank showing that it can be a lot more complex in some cases. So this one query that we had that had, I think it was something 100 or 200 plans, something like that. <laughs> so, so the point here is that sometimes it's easy to find out which plan to force. Sometimes it'd be quite tricky to find out which plan to force. And which one is the best here? I mean, it's really difficult to say. The most important is to avoid the blue one and uh, the pink one. I mean, that's the, if you have an ongoing incident, then you want to avoid those plans. Then if you pick the most, super most optimal, maybe that's not important. You just have to pick one that looks reasonably good and then try that. Yeah, yeah. So, so a comment was there could be an uh, exclusion feature. There's no such feature. No. It would be good, but there's no such feature. So here's just an overview of the different options in Query Storm. So um, I will not go through all of them, but a few I want to highlight. So there is the, the max size by default in 16 and 70 is, is only 100 megabytes. Um, in 19, it's been increased to one gigabyte. And I would recommend, in most cases, increase it if you're in 16 and 17. We have been running in one, one gigabyte, and that's been working fine in most systems. What happens if you have it too low is there is another option that is called size-based size -based cleanup mode. And that, by default, is, is auto, or meaning on. Uh, what happened then is that if the query store is too small, the max size, then it will start deleting data. Even if you have set it to the default the number of days, it's 30 days. If you run into the maximum size, uh, if you have this set to auto, then it will start deleting some of the old data or some of the queries that are not so, uh, not so useful. Yes. Yeah, so then we'll keep the newest one. So, um, okay, so interval is, um, that's what I was talking before. That, that is, uh, query store is storing all the runtime statistics and weight statistics by intervals. So you can see by default, hour by hour. Um, I would be careful about reducing this too much. We are running, yeah, you can say take snapshot every one hour. So it's like, and not, not really a snapshot, you can say that it's like aggregate, aggregate hour by hour. So hour by hour you can see how many executions, what was the average duration and so on for each query for each plan. So I think that in most cases one hour. Of course the, the lower you set it, the more um, space it takes, the bigger overhead and so on. Have you ever seen that problem with uh, time interruption? No, 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 we have not experienced that. The question what what's the most performance impact for the flushing? No, we have not seen that. So another setting that's important, there is one that's called query capture mode. And that by, um, by default, it is set to, um, in uh, 16 and 17, it's set to all, meaning capturing all queries. In 19, they've changed it to auto by default. So auto meaning that SQL Server is only capturing what they think is like important queries. And what that means, that is uh, not documented. But it means that if you have very small query that maybe ex only executed once, then you will not get it in the query store. And our experience is that this auto is a good setting. So we are using it also in 16 and 17. Question. Yes, question here? Yeah. I mean, that's an extreme number. So question, what, what about this uh, max plans per query? I mean, uh, I mean, that's extreme. Having 200 different plans in one query, I don't think we have ever run, in, run, run in across that, uh, that uh, limitation. I mean, 
in most cases, you only have a few different plants that is uh, changing. So this, this, this setting, that's just a protection so that it should not be that query stores having one query with maybe 10,000 plans for the same query. I mean, it's just a protection against some extreme scenarios. So I've never touched this setting. I don't know. I don't know how that works. I, my guess is that it will, show, it will store the 201st one and then it will stop storing, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, let's move on here. So, okay, so now we've been looking at a little bit, uh, yeah, the basics of query store. Now we've got into some of the, some of the limitations, some of the, of the scenarios that we have been experiencing. So, like we, we have been looking at here, Query Store is storing a lot of data. All the data about quer queries, plans, query text, runtime statistics, and so on. But there are a few things that is not stored, and that makes it a bit difficult sometimes, and that is, there is no context of the execution. You don't have any information about who executed the query. Uh, what was the login name? What was the host name? Uh, what was the application name? You don't have any information like this. And that means that query store only works if you know the query. If you know, if you have an incident that, oh, something happened, a timeout uh, happened uh, yesterday from uh, this server at this, this point in time, if you don't know the query, then you cannot really use query to troubleshoot it. So I will show you some, some workarounds for that. Another thing to be aware of is that um, the plans that are stored in uh, Query Store, it is, um, there's no actual number of, um, of rows, so actual number of batches, no runtime information inside uh, the plans at all. And that is because it's like the plans are only stored like the first time they are executed, and then they are not changed. The actual number of columns, they are like different for every execution. So you don't have that information. Any question about this? Doesn't it average for all of the um, So, so um, qu question was, doesn't it average? So what I'm talking about here is that if you go into uh, the runtime statistics, I mean, the, in the runtime statistics view, that is average for all executions. What I'm talking about is the information that you see inside the execution plan. So, for example, if you take an execution plan in Management Studio and look at the actual execution plan, then you will have estimated of, estimate number of rows, actual number of rows. The actual there you will not see in Query Store because that will require Query Store to save every plan for every execution, and that is not doing. Uh, um, I would think that it has the parameter that was used for the, for the execution. I mean, for the, when the plan was compiled. I would have to check that, but I'm pretty sure of that. So another thing, of course, is that um, all the runtime statistics is aggregated data. There's no information about uh, individual executions. You have those like one hour interval and you have aggregated data for that. You have average, you have uh, mean and max and so on. But if you want to have information about individual executions, then you need to use trace or extended events. Any question here before I proceed? Okay, so if we look at the first problem here again, uh, what if you have, um, how do you find the query? So, um, if you stop the studio, um, then it's easy. Then you take the object ID, and then you can use that to find the query ID. Um, if it's not a stop procedure, um, then how do you find it? Sometimes it can be really difficult because there are many similar queries and maybe don't even know the query from the incident. So one method that we have been using 
a lot in Sexobank and also with other customers. That is to collect data from the metric request. Yeah, question? That's, that's correct. So comment was that um, the, the, if you're looking at the stop procedure, there might be multiple statements, and each of those statements will have their own query IDs. So um, yes, you have to um, yeah, you have to figure out which statement it is. But still, if you have the if you have the stop procedure name, then it's a little bit easier at least to find it. So if it's an the other method that I was talking about here is that, and that is, I would say, the best method in all the scenarios. That is if you're collecting data from uh, DMX requests and DMX sessions. Um, if you do that all the time, then you have two columns there that's called statement SQL handle and the statement context ID. And the good thing with those columns is that you can take those and then you can go into Query Store and then you find the query in the Query Store. So if you collect data from DMX request and DMX sessions all the time, okay, then whenever it's a problem, then you can go back in time, you can filter on some of the data you have in DMX sessions, like the login name, for example, and timestamps, and then you can uh, take those two columns, and then you can uh, find the query ID in Query Store. Have anyone been using this method, been using those columns here? Okay. Okay, that I would say the most powerful method of, of uh, finding queries in Query Store. But it only works if you're collecting data all the time from those queries, or sorry, from those, uh, those views. So in my, demos, my, in my demo machine here, I'm collecting this information every 10 seconds. I will show you here in the, in the demo here in a minute. So there's one more method, and that is uh, collecting data from extended events. Uh, then you have the SQL handle, and then you have the offset. That's another method you can use. Yes, a question here? Can you also collect the query ID with the union? So, sorry, say that again. Can you also collect the query ID with the union? The view of, say it. The name, the name of the view, can you also connect with the query ID? Uh, no, no, that will not work. So the question is what, what if the query against the view? No, I don't, that will not work. So, um, okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So that's the best, uh, that would be the best method. That would be the best method. But you cannot use the object ID for the view. Okay, so then let's look at the real problem here. So let's say that we have a query that was timing out here uh, last night and uh, you got an incident, you want to, uh, you have the timestamp, you have some information about the host name and login name, maybe the application name, and then we want to find it in Query Store and try to analyze, was it maybe a plan change or what was it? So, um, now we're gonna see here how we can use the data from the DMX request and the DMX accession to find the query in Query Store. So I'm going to execute the query here now, and this is um, will be the query from uh, from last night, and then we can see if we can find it. So for this demo, I'm collecting data in the DBA database from the DMVs. That could of course also be in uh, in a real uh, production environment. It could be a central database, uh, but here I just have it locally. So I just filter on the login name, the host name, and the application name. So let's see what we get here. Okay, so since I'm collecting every 10 seconds, we will get like a snapshot here every 10 seconds. And now I will just look at those two columns I was talking about before. So I go out here a little bit. And then we we'll see here, we have the statement SQL handle, and we have the 
statement context ID. So what I'm going to do now is that I copy those values here into a query here against query store. So I just paste it in here. And the context settings ID is already correct. So this is just a join from the query table and the query text table. And now we see we got the query ID. So we started out with an incident where we, did not, we, we had some information about the host name and login name and so on, but we did not know the query. It was not clear from the incident what was the query. And then by correlating it from DMX request, DMX accessions over to query store, we're able to find the query ID. And then you can continue to analyze from there. You can look at the plans, you can look at the runtime statistics and the waste statistics and so on. Any question about this method? Yes? So the so question is, what if you execute the same store procedure like from different types of application? So actually I have that in the next slide, but yes, that matters. Because if the set options are different, then it will be different query IDs. So I will show that in the next demo. Yes? I'm, yeah. yeah. So, so the question was that, okay, in this case, I'm mostly concerned about specific uh, queries. Yes, in this case, I'm, I'm uh, focusing on that. As I was showing in one of the, 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 the slides in the beginning, there are different scenarios. There are also scenarios where you want to look at overall who is using the most resources. Here I was focusing on a specific incident. Okay, let's proceed here. So, um, Okay, so let's say that you have two different uh, applications executing the same store procedure. Then they will, in many cases, have different set options. For example, you have a .NET, .NET application, you have Management Studio, different set options. There will be different query IDs. So how do you find it? How do you find the right one? For example, what can happen is that you have the production application and business application, and then you have some developer or DBA executing something in the management studio. Which one is the right one? So what I would do here is that I will execute um, I will execute the stop procedure twice. One time in management studio and one time in SQL CMD. Okay, so now we try to find it in Query Store. And I filter on the name of the store procedure. And then we see, okay, there is actually uh, two different query IDs. Only this context settings ID is different. So to find out about that, then you need to use the data from the DMX request to uh, find out, okay, which is the real one. Because if you have a production incident, then you want to make sure that if you're gonna force a plan, then you do it for the real production application. You don't want to do plan forcing for the management studio that uh, some DBA is testing with. I mean, that don't really solve the production problem. So, uh, yes. I mean, Sorry? Yeah, but then it will solve, so then it will solve the problem for, for, the develop, for the DBA or for the developer. You will not solve the problem for the production application. Okay. Yes? 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. That's correct. There's there's a view and there's a view. They, they are distinct. There's a view in that in a query store. I did not show that here, but there is. Yes. Okay. So um, let's move on. Oh, it's a question about link server. Let's take that uh, afterwards. Yeah. Okay, this is a little bit more a reference slide. Uh, the important here is that in the query table, the query ID is the primary key, and then there's a set of columns here that's like unique combination of columns. And if any of those are changing, that means that you will get a new query ID. So for example, if uh, context settings ID, is changing, okay, that's uh, part of the unique key. That means that then we'll get a new query ID. That's the reason why we could see that there was two different query IDs when the set options were different. I will not go into all the details here, uh, but you can have it as reference. This is the same for plans. So for plans is the query plan hash. That's like the unique key for each query. <coughs> so, um, okay, when you're using plan forcing, so uh, some quite common issues. So, um, one is that, okay, you have, um, you have maybe a stop procedure and then the developers, they are uh, releasing a new version of the uh, maybe application of the stop procedures. And in that script, they are dropping and recreating the objects. And if you do that, with a, in, not altering them, but dropping and recreating, if you do that, there will be a new object ID. And because of that, it will be a new query ID. And if you don't have doing any plan forcing, okay, that was on the old query ID. The new query ID will not have any forced plan. So, don't do that, do alter instead. And of course the same if you, someone has been doing some small modifications to the, to the SQL statements. It could even be just some formatting stuff. Then it would be a new statement to SQL handle and a new query ID. And the same, you maybe, had, you maybe have a production incident one month ago, you fix the problem by forcing a plan and then someone is doing some small changes or some big changes to some stop procedure, maybe adding a column or something. Okay, new query ID, no more forced plan. Then you have to force it again. Yes, a question there? Uh, oh, I, I will come to that in a, in a later slide here. So another scenario that we run, run into, across here in, um, in Sexobank uh, that's not so well known, that is if you have a store procedure and that store procedure has a query that's referencing a temporary table or a table variable. Um, then it's actually like this that the database ID is a part of the batch SQL handle that's one of, one of the columns in query store. And as we can see here in the previous slides here, we can see that this batch SQL handle, that's actually part of the key. So why is that a problem? So what happened for us is that we have a critical production incident. We use query store to force the plan that fixed it. And then maybe one month later, we run into the same problem again, even though we had forced the plan. And at first we could not see it because we were looking at it and it was not forced, but we were sure we had forced it in the past. So what happened then, uh, this was then a stop procedure with a temporary table and there had been a failover. So if there is a failover, then it might be that on the other server, then there is a different database ID. And because there's a different database ID, there would be a new batch SQL handle. And new batch SQL handle, as it's part of the key, you will get a new query ID. So that means that it's a new query and you don't have any false plan anymore. So 
It's not a bug, but it's uh, also not really documented, but that's how it works. It's only the scenario we have stored procedure with temporary tables or table variables. You can run, it, run, run into this problem. So, uh, okay, so question here, what's the workaround? Okay, you need to force the plan, I mean that uh, you need to force the plan once more. That's the only uh, workaround. I mean that after the failover, you have to <laughs> maybe uh, do a recompile and then maybe if you're lucky, you get a good plan and then you can force that again. That's the only possibility. So when you, when you do that, yeah. you can force it again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, then yeah, yeah, then it works, then it works. And then, of course, if you have another failover, failover back, then it also works, because then you had already forced it on that query ID. So it'll be like, when it's running on server A, it have one query ID, when it's running on server B, it has another query ID. So when it forces it, it doesn't force it based on that ID, it forces it purely on the system ID. I mean, it's forcing it on the query ID. It's just that you have two different query IDs. One query ID running on one server, one query ID like on the other server. Yeah, can we take it in the end? I, I'm getting a bit uh, short of time. Please come up in the end. Yeah, yeah, here's just a little bit more details about that. So another important thing here, that is, so when you're changing the compatibility level or the Kalinati estimator, the recommendation here is that you, uh, you enable query store and then you let it run for some time, maybe a week, maybe a month, to make sure that you get like a baseline of the plans that's being used. And then you do the change. And that's of course a bit risky change because sometimes there are some, uh, some queries that's getting some plans that maybe it's, uh, maybe it's getting slower. Um, and then you can use uh, queries to, uh, to force, those, uh, force the old plans, force the old good plans. That's like the recommended uh, practice from, uh, from Microsoft when you do the changes. It almost seems like forcing the plan is like a temporary solution when you really should fix the underlying issue. Yeah, the yeah. So, so common theory is that, uh, okay, maybe uh, plan forcing is like a temporary solution. Yes, it is a temporary solution because it's not, it's not very robust. I mean, it works as long as nothing is changing. But if something small is changing, then it's not forced anymore. So what I want to highlight here is that, and that's not in the Microsoft recommendation, uh, that is the things in red. So if we start from the bottom here, we see that in certain scenarios you get the new query IDs. Okay, so we don't want to do anything at the same time when we do the change of the compatibility level or canality estimator. We want to be sure that we have the same query IDs after the change, otherwise we cannot force any old plans. Okay, so we don't want to do any code changes at the same time, because code changes, then we'll get new query IDs. You also don't want to move to new servers at the same time, because we saw that in some cases, move, doing a failover, getting a new database ID, could give a new query ID. So we also don't want to do that at the same time. And we also don't want to do any upgrade of SQL Server at the same time, because there is some small risk that maybe Microsoft has changed something, some hashing function or logic or whatever, so that uh, it's getting new query IDs. So do the, change, do the change of the compatibility level or the canality estimator in a weekend or when it's a good time, and don't do any other changes at that day. You can do it before or after. I mean, that maybe a few days before or a few days after but not at the same time. If you do that, then Query Store is a very good uh, uh, tool for uh, forcing plan if you run into any problems. But if you do changes at the same time, then you're getting new Query IDs, new Query IDs, meaning that there are no, no old good plans because it's a new query, and then you cannot do any plan forcing. I mean, you cannot force any old plans because there are no old good plans from before the change. Any question here? So the question was, if you're using legacy kernelty estimator, yeah, so if you're doing that and you want to change to the new kernelty estimator, then I would enable query store, let it run for some time, do the change to the new kernelty estimator, see how it runs. If you run into any problems, 
then you force the old plans for those queries. And then after that, you can analyze it more uh, closely, maybe some changes to queries or indexing or whatever. But as a temporal solution, force the plans. But don't do any other changes at the same time as you change the compatibility level or can alter the estimator. So, um, weight statistics. Uh, that was added in uh, SQL Server 2017. So, it's not weight types, it's something called weight categories. So, for example, there's one weight category called, um, called uh, lock, and that covers all the weight types that call something with LCK. And the reason for that is that there is so many different weight types. I think there's almost 500 weight types. And storing information about each of them individually, that would just be too much uh, data to store, too much performance overhead. So Microsoft have come up with these weight categories. So I think there's about 20 categories. So it will store it like network, CPU, uh, memory, and so on. Still very useful. Uh, but there's one scenario here that we experienced in, uh, in Saxe Bank that's very important to be aware of. And that is, if you have a, if you have a transaction that's writing data, um, then when you look at the weight statistics, um, and also when you look at the, right, the runtime uh, statistics in query store, then the time and the weights for hardening of the log to disk is not included. So it's like you have the transactions getting written first to transaction log buffers in memory, and then it's hardened to disk, and it's also sent to the secondary replica if always on. In query store, it looks like it's only the write to memory that's included, not the hardening to disk, not the write to the secondary replica. And I don't think it's a bug and some kind of the, uh, by design limitation, but that's how it works. And it's actually the same with the old uh, query stats uh, DMV, that behaves exactly the same. So I will show you that, that uh, here in a demo. So for this demo here, I have set up uh, availability groups, synchronous availability groups, two different uh, virtual machines on my computer. So, let's see here. Okay, so the idea here is that we're gonna take and stop procedure. We're gonna execute it thousand times. This stop procedure, the only thing it's doing is inserting one record. There are no transactions. I mean, no explicit transactions. So just uh, each insert will be like its own uh, auto transaction, auto commit transaction. So I will just I have a loop here, just executing this. And then the idea is to afterwards look in query store, look in some of the DMVs, and see how the data looks like. Okay, so this was taking nine seconds here for 1,000 executions. Okay. So that's nine milliseconds for each execution. Now let's go into some of the DMVs. So we're gonna look at the procedure statistics. And I filter on the name of the stop procedure. Okay, so let's see here. We see here we have 1,000 executions. And I want to see the elapsed time. Total elapsed time, nine seconds. So that's the same as we 
saw here. So it looks like the procedure statistics is showing correct information. Now, we're going to look at um, the weights. And I do that by using the session weight stats. So I take the session ID, 59. So this view, this uh, DMV here is only showing weight for a specific session. So I execute that. Okay, so let's look at the weights here. We have some write log, that's the uh, hardening of to transaction log on disk. And we have some huddle sync commits. And we see the sum of those two here. The big ones is something like 8.7 seconds. This is milliseconds here. So that's also quite good. I mean, we had nine seconds here. This is showing 8.7 seconds in total. So, so far, everything matches. OK, now we go into query store. So first, I need to find a query. So I just use the same query as you've been seeing before. Query ID 2. So we don't need to look at the plan. We want to look at the runtime statistics for this specific query. Now let's see here. So we have 1,000 executions. And average duration, 63. So this is 63 microseconds, meaning that for 1,000 executions, it's just 63 milliseconds. We saw that it was not taking 63 milliseconds. It was taking nine seconds. Now, if we go into the weight statistics in Query Store, so let's see what weight we have for this query. We have some buffer IO here, and let's see. Total query wait time, millisecond, 10 milliseconds. So you see here, for this scenario, where transactions that are writing, then query store is not giving a complete picture. And from what I can see, hardening to disk, synchronization for secondary replicas is not included. And as I said, it's the same with the query stats, DMV, that behaves exactly the same. So, um, any questions here? I think you have zero for the current query. Because I think because you want to commit about the query itself, you don't want information about an auto in and outside the query. And those can be variable. The disk can be you know, overloaded at times. Yes. So so, so co comment here was that maybe it's good, but I would say that, okay, but you're actually looking something that was taking a certain amount of time. And when you look at it in Query Store, it's not really reflecting that. I mean, it's not showing those weights that actually was in play here. I mean, there was some harder, we can see here before, we saw that we had some, we had those weights, we had the write log weights, and we had a harder thing commit weights, but it's not shown in Query Store. And it's also a little bit bad if, okay, someone is coming and saying that, oh, this, uh, these transactions are slow. And then you go in and look at it in Query Store, and it's just showing that it's super fast. So, yeah, so. Then you know that the issue is not with the query itself, but it's with the outside. Yeah, yeah. So, th so this is just something to be aware of. And if you want to see the complete picture, then you need to look at the procedure stats, the session weight stats or some of the extended events. For example, RPC completed, batch completed, module end. They show, they show like the complete picture. It could still be useful information in Query Store because maybe there was some blocking or something, then you will see it. But you will not see those weight type li like I mentioned. So question if, if they will add that, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't heard anything about it. So it's been like this all the time. Uh, also like, a,
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But queries, but sh queries should reflect the, the complete. I mean, should we be give the complete picture? I would think. I mean, it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there are pros and cons of, I mean, the different behaviors. But this at least how it's working, and that's just what's the point here. It's important to be aware of how it's working, and uh, so that when troubleshooting, then you know about it. Okay, so this one we cover. So a few more scenarios here. So let's say that you have a, you have a session that's been running for a long time, and you kill it. And we had a scenario like this. We kill the session, and then we were looking at for the data in query store, and we cannot find it. We cannot find any aborted queries in, uh, in query store. And then we were doing, doing some testing and found out that if a session is getting killed or if an um, application or, or server is getting restarted or if it crashes, then you will not get it in the query store runtime statistics or in the weight statistics. You will still get it in the query view or in the plan view, but you will not get it in the runtime statistics or the weight statistics. So you will only get aborted queries in those views if there is a command timeout, or if you are canceling a query, then you will get it. But not if it's killed or restarted or similar. And this is just how it works. It's just to be aware of. It's a little bit edge scenario, but yeah, we have run into it a few times. Okay, that works the same also. Okay. I see, I see. Yeah, common theory was the same, common theory was the same behavior as the, the query stats, yes. So, um, yes. Yes. So, that, so in our case, we had something that's been running for, uh, SSS packets that's been running for a long time, something with data warehouse. We, uh, there was no timeout, so we killed it and updated statistics and then started this package again, and then was running fast. And then we wanted to go in and compare the plans, and we could not really figure out about it. So, but let's say in the unit, all the statistics you gathered would go into that, that very final, what is the reason? Yeah, yeah, so, so if you have this, if you have this, if you have a successful execution, then it will of course be stored. It's so all, we will dump it in the last interval then. Yeah, yeah, it will get, it will get in the last interval. Yeah. It will get in the last interval. But you will. If you were monitoring it, I would see the ones that were occurring. They wouldn't be in that interval. They'd happen during query execution. That's right. So That's it right. It took an hour to do, and you have 10 minute intervals. We'll take, we'll take all the ones that occurred in that hour. So, so que question here was how is it working if you have um, queries query that is spanning several interval? I'm not 100% sure, but I think it will be stored in the last one. Oh, so the query timeout, then you will see an uh, uh, aborted uh, execution in the runtime statistics. Okay, the plan forcing we discussed before. So this one I'm skipping. There's a few trace flag. Uh, this one here. Um, if you see 7752, if you see the QDS low DB uh, weights, um, then you might consider adding this trace flag. Uh, it's not needed in 2019, it's uh, only required, or only, you can only add it in 16 and 17. And that is only needed if you have a very large query store, because it's like this, that when a database is starting up, then it's starting by loading some data from query store. And it will like not let any user queries in until it's loaded data from query store. So this trace flag means that it will, uh, data will, database will get, just get online just without query store. And then query store will come online a bit later or start working a bit later. So they made it the change, this change in 2019. So um, I think that was, um, that was the thing I had. Um, thank you for uh, attending the session.
And if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to com come up here afterwards. I will be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs>